Dr. Kelly Reshanowski, and I'm a clinical assistant professor at Stanford University. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Ash Ryder, a clinical instructor fellow at Stanford University. We are both emergency medicine physicians working, like you, on the front lines of COVID-19. The majority of morbidity and mortality from COVID is acute respiratory distress syndrome that requires intubation and mechanical ventilation. In this lecture, we are going to review the indications for intubation and the procedure of endotracheal intubation. In this lecture, we will be covering the following topics. The indications for intubation of the severely dyspneic patient, methods for pre-oxygenation suggested for COVID patients, and how to prepare for intubation. We will then review the appropriate procedure for endotracheal intubation. And finally, confirming placement of the endotracheal tube with all the considerations for the COVID patient. Delaying intubation until the patient acutely decompensates is dangerous for both the patient and healthcare workers. We recommend a low threshold to intubate for patients with rapidly progressive respiratory distress with hypoxia and lack of improvement despite other safe, non-invasive oxygenation strategies such as high-flow nasal cannula or non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Evidence of respiratory distress indicating the need for intubation includes increased work of breathing, worsening mental status, hemodynamic instability, or multi-organ failure. It is important to provide oxygen to the patient prior to intubation or pre-oxygenation in order to avoid hypoxia during the procedure. Oxygen delivery methods include nasal cannula up to six liters and a non-rebreather mask at 15 liters. Both of these should be covered by a surgical mask on the patient to reduce droplet dispersion. Some institutions have approved the use of high-flow nasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation strategies such as CPAP or BiPAP. It is important to provide the highest level of oxygen approved by your institution and safe for the patient prior to intubation. Pre-oxygenation aims to increase the oxygen reservoir of the lungs to extend the safe apnea time. The goal for safe apnea time is to decrease the need for bad valve mask ventilation after induction and paralysis, thereby minimizing the risk of aspiration from stomach insufflation during bagging when the patient is paralyzed. Ensure that your patient has adequate IV access. We recommend to have at least two functioning forms of access prior to intubation. This is important to prevent partial induction or paralysis if one point of access fails. Thorough preparation is the best means for success during intubation. Gathering and checking the function of all supplies, including your ambu bag, endotracheal tube, stylet, syringe, laryngoscope, viral filter, end tidal, bougie, suction, and your ventilator. Your institution may have variable equipment. It is important to select an appropriate size Mac blade, Miller blade, or video laryngoscope blade, if available, for the size of your patient. The appropriate endotracheal tube diameter should also be selected based on your patient's size. For most adults, this is often between a 7.0 and an 8.0 tube. If available, a viral filter is recommended to be integrated into both the ventilator and ambu bag circuit. It is critical to check the function of your endotracheal tube cuff. This is done using a syringe to inflate and ensure there are no tears or air leaks. Be sure to fully deflate the cuff prior to the procedure. Also, make sure that your stylet is in the endotracheal tube and shape the tube to your desired style, either curved or hockey stick. In preparation for intubation, you will also need to assemble your blade and ensure that the light is functional. Positioning the patient prior to intubation will ensure best first pass success. First, the bed height should be raised to the intubating provider's comfort. Typically, this will be between the lower rib margin and mid chest to reduce strain or discomfort to the provider during the procedure. Additionally, the patient should be positioned in order to achieve the best view to the glottis by aligning the three axes of the airway, the oral, pharyngeal, and laryngeal. This sniffing position 
is the combination of flexion of the neck and extension of the head. This is done by placing a small pillow or folded blanket under the patient's head to flex the cervical spine and then extending the head will align the pharyngeal and laryngeal axes as shown. Once the patient is paralyzed, your first maneuver is to open the mouth using the scissor technique. This is done by placing your right thumb on the patient's lower teeth and your right index or second finger on the patient's upper teeth, then pushing the mouth open. Be sure to not put any pressure or pinch the lips. Also be sure to keep your fingers as far to the right of the mouth as possible to allow space for the laryngoscope blade. Once the mouth is open, take the blade in your left hand and insert it to the right side of the patient's mouth, sweeping the tongue away from midline. Be sure you avoid rocking back on the teeth as shown here on the right. Instead, keep the blade forward and off of the upper teeth as you slowly advance along the tongue down until you visualize the epiglottis. A mat blade tip will be placed in the molecula. A miller blade tip will be used to lift the epiglottis. Once the tip of the blade is positioned, exert force forward and away from you, lifting up without rocking back. Once you visualize the vocal cords, take the ET tube in your right hand and introduce it from the right side of the mouth, passing through the cords, leaving the tube at a depth of approximately three times the tube diameter. Inflate the cup and remove the stylet. After inflating the cuff, immediately connect the ventilator to the endotracheal tube to prevent the patient from hypoxia and yourself from droplets. Secure the ET tube to ensure no dislodgement. You can then listen for bilateral breath sounds while the tube is held in place. There are multiple ways to confirm proper placement of the endotracheal tube. As shown in the video, the first is to auscultate both sides of the chest and the upper abdomen. This will confirm bilateral breath sounds and no sounds of air insufflating the stomach. You should also visualize the chest rise of the patient and ensure it is equal. If the endotracheal tube has been advanced too far, it may have cannulated the right bronchus and you may only be ventilating the right lung. If you hear lung sounds on the right, but not the left, pull back on the endotracheal tube until you hear breath sounds on both sides. You can also check for appropriate expired CO2 from the lung using either an exhaled color metric in tidal CO2 or waveform capnography if either are available. Finally, the endotracheal tube can be visualized on chest x-ray and the tip should extend below the clavicles and approximately two centimeters above the carina. Now we are going to view a video of a complete intubation that recaps all of the steps we just reviewed. First, initiate your pre-oxygenation. Then be sure to position the patient appropriately. Call a timeout before you begin the procedure. It's important to verbalize your dosing of your RSI medications. This topic will be addressed in our next video. Anticipate desaturation and have the most experienced provider perform the intubation procedure. Connect the ET tube directly to the ventilator and confirm placement listening to breath sounds bilaterally. Then you will need to verbalize your post-intubation sedation plan. In event of ventilator failure or desaturation, be prepared to use the AMBU bag with the viral filter to bag through the endotracheal tube as shown here. In summary, Treating the Severely Dissonant Patient, part two of our series, reviews, recognizing the need for intubation in a patient that is not improving despite other modes of oxygenation or non-invasive ventilation, the need for pre-oxygenation to extend the safe apnea time, the importance to prepare equipment as well as the patient for intubation, the procedural steps of endotracheal intubation, 
And finally, methods for confirming accurate placement of the endotracheal tube. Thank you for watching, and please continue on to approach to the dyspneic patient part three to review the appropriate sedative and paralytic medication for the intubation of patients with COVID.